Um, my, my name is Eric Lee. I'm a genetic pathologist from Virtus Genetics. Uh, today I'll be speaking about uh, genetic carrier screening uh, before pregnancy, state of the art. Uh, this is a disclaimer page from, our, uh, from the folks at Thermo Fisher. Uh, this is a disclosure of my conflicts of interest. So I am an employee of Virtus Diagnostics, which is a provider of reproductive carrier screening tests. Uh, so recessive genetic conditions are important and are common, uh, as we all know. Um, recessive meaning that both partners of a couple uh, need to be carriers for there to be a risk of having an affected child. Um, this particular figure is from a, a global report on birth defects from 2006. And essentially what it confirms is that recessive genetic conditions are collectively common, uh, more common in fact than chromosomal conditions like Down syndrome. Uh, for which we know uh, screening in pregnancy is, is well established. Um, so carry screening for recessive, recessive conditions isn't going to eliminate the risk of having a child with a genetic condition. Uh, there, there isn't a genetic test that can do that. Um, but, it, but what it does do is reduce the risk of one very important class uh, of genetic conditions at birth. Uh, carry screening is also not new. So it's been around for many years. But in the past, most carry screening was done in a very targeted way. So for a small number of genes and um, really limited to those who could pay the out-of-pocket costs um, for the test. Um, only the most common recessive conditions um, tended to be targeted. And in Australia, and in, um, Australia they, they were uh, cystic fibrosis, spinal muscular atrophy and, and fragile X syndrome. Um, so the carry screening uh, in and of itself is certainly not new. So if carrier screening is not new and there's, you know, why is, why is there seemingly a, a renewed focus on carrier screening? Why um, are a lot more people talking about carrier screening? Um, and I think there are a few reasons. Uh, so the first is that the laboratory technologies um, that are used for genetic testing uh, have advanced exponentially. Um, so it's not that we started off with three genes and now we can test five or 10 genes. It's not that sort of incremental um, improvement. We can actually test hundreds of genes um, all at once. And we can even, um, if we wanted to, um, test all genes that are known to cause recessive conditions. Um, and that's thanks to technology called next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequencing. Um, yes, these tests do cost more, um, but these test costs are going to continue to, to decrease um, over time. Um, so there's really been a paradigm shift in terms of what's technologically uh, possible and feasible. Uh, a second um, change is that in recent years, um, several professional organisations have um, issued or, or reaffirmed their recommendations around um, carrier screening. Um, these include the American College of um, Obstetrics and Gynecology, as well as the Australian and New Zealand um, Colleges of ONG. Um, and they serve as a clear standard set by peers that uh, information on carrier screening should be offered to all women who are pregnant or are planning pregnancy. Um, so it's no longer uh, a test that you might offer if patients express an interest. It, there, there really is an onus, I think, to provide that information now to everyone um, in, that, um, in that scenario. And then the third change has been um, in the area of test fee um, reimbursement. So governments are reimbursing um, uh, our carrier screening um, these, you know, these tests aren't cheap. They cost hundreds of dollars per person. Um, and that's a barrier to, to widespread adoption of these tests. Um, in Australia, tests for the three gene carrier screen um, are due to be reimbursable by the end of 2023. Um, and as with any kind of um, genetic testing reimbursement that comes out, um, it is expected that that's going to really um, significantly increase the number of patients who, who seek out um, these tests. Um, and so these changes start to introduce some, some new considerations. Um, you know, there are more choices, more options for patients and doctors to consider um, because it's more than just um, the three gene screen. Uh, there are lots of uh, commercial labs that are now providing extended or, or expanded um, carrier screening tests. Um, and um, as clinicians, you want to recommend the tests that provide the most um, value, um, but it can sometimes be hard to know exactly which one to recommend. And so some of those factors that you might consider are the number of genes on the panel, uh, the composition of the panel, so how common the, the, the conditions are, the number of recessive conditions versus X-linked conditions, for example, uh, the price of the test, 
um, and service considerations like turnaround time and how, how understandable or clear the lab reports are. Um, and today, I just wanted to go into detail about two of these factors. Um, that's the number of genes on the panel and the, I guess, general panel composition. Um, so the first thing to note is that carrier screening panels are only getting um, bigger over time. So with more genes and more conditions um, included. Um, the main limitation at the moment is not the technology or even a clinical consideration, um, if, if you, but, but it's really about cost effectiveness. Um, so if you look at two panels that test a similar range of conditions, but one panel happens to um, have a, a much larger number of genes than the other, then that larger panel is going to pick up more couples who are at risk, um, even if that's an incremental increase. Um, so as testing costs come down, as labs are able to test more and more genes, it is inevitable that the panels will get bigger. Um, and in fact, the American College of Medical uh, Genetics, ACMG, have uh, recently issued updated carry screening guidelines uh, that now uh, recommend expanded uh, carry screening panels in the general population. Um, specifically, uh, this tier, um, the so-called tier three um, panel, which includes disorders with um, carrier frequencies greater than one in 200. Um, and really the main basis for this recommendation is that these larger panels are going to be better suited to carrier screening um, in diverse populations because clearly a, a person's genetic ancestry is going to influence the genes that they're most likely um, carriers for. Um, the ACMG have also defined the genes that should be covered as part of a tier three panel. So in the past, you know, each lab has provided uh, has, has chosen their own set of genes um, using their own set of criteria. Um, and few of these existing panels actually cover the ACMG list. Um, but I would expect that, that over time, um, labs will incorporate um, all of the genes um, at some point. Um, so there is now a clear push um, for more than just, say, the three gene screen from the likes of um, the ACMG. But the, the caveat to these bigger panels is that the, the bigger they get, um, the, uh, the more incremental that increase in, in yield um, gets. So a panel that's twice as large um, as another panel is not going to identify twice as many couples at risk. That's, that's just not how that's um, going to work. Um, so even if one person turns out to be a carrier, it's really a new roll of the dice when it comes to whether their partner is a carrier of the same condition. So um, as an analogy, the chance of rolling a six with one dice is a one in six chance, but the chance of rolling two sixes on two dice is, is one in 36, a much lower chance. And so that need to consider results on a couple's basis for carrier screening does reduce how much utility you get from simply increasing the number of genes um, on a panel. And that's really what this graph um, shows, again, from the same um, ACMG uh, guidelines which shows that as you include more genes in the panel with lower and lower um, population carrier frequencies, yes, you will identify more uh, at-risk couples, but there comes a point where there are clearly diminishing returns. So for a panel that includes genes with carrier frequencies um, higher than 1 in 1,000, if you compare that to a panel uh, with carrier frequencies higher than 1 in 200, you're estimated to pick up um, about five additional couples per 10,000, five additional at-risk couples per 10,000 couples tested. That's still clearly important for those five couples, but it also does uh, make it clear that, that the number of genes is, is not the be-all and end-all when it comes to which test to choose. And then one thing to note about panel composition, uh, many panels do overlap for common uh, well-known conditions, recessive conditions, but there will be others that are unique to, to certain labs. And it's and um, that in itself, there's nothing um, wrong with that. And it's really the, the lab's responsibility to ensure that the genes that they include on a panel are appropriate and um, remain focused on conditions that are severe, um, early onset, and um, life limiting. Uh, now, some labs do offer testing for milder um, adult onset conditions or conditions where um, uh, only a small proportion of people actually end up uh, being affected by a condition. Um, but these can often provide more information than is useful. And so it's good to be cautious about um, including um, these optional extras just for the sake of more. Um, if these findings aren't actually likely to be used for, say, pre-implantation genetic testing, prenatal testing, um, or, other, or other types of uh, reproductive um, planning, 
So again, really just emphasizing that there is more to this um, than just the number of genes um, on a panel. Now, it might still be confusing as to um, which test is best. As, as clinicians, um, you don't have the time to investigate each of these tests um, in detail. Um, but I, what I would say is that, that I don't think that that's the most important question, actually. Um, because even though things might look different, um, there might be new technology, there might be bigger panels or whatever else, I think the most up-to-date message around carrier screening um, is that uh, good clinical practice will still make the most difference to most patients, um, perhaps reassuringly, um, more so than the actual test um, that's chosen. So what do I mean by that? It's things like ideally undertaking carrier screening preconception. Uh, because we know that this opens up a lot more options for prospective parents than testing in pregnancy. In pregnancy, the options are really prenatal testing and whether to continue the pregnancy if the fetus is um, affected. But prior to conception, th there are a lot more options available, again, such as pre-implantation genetic testing or the use of gamete or, or embryo donors, as an example. Um, if you're performing testing sequentially, which is still the most common way carrier screening is done, where you test one partner first and only test the other partner if the first partner is a carrier of something, you should ensure that you test the female partner first. And that's because most labs will only test for X-linked disorders in females and not males, uh, because we know that males um, are unlikely to be carriers of X-linked conditions. So if you end up in a, in a situation where you test the male partner first instead, they're not a carrier for anything, and you fail to test the female partner because of that, there remains that risk of excellent conditions for that couple because that female partner hasn't been tested. Uh, so the puzzle for that couple, um, so to speak, is uh, incomplete in that kind of, um, with that sort of testing strategy. Um, when you test both partners, whether sequentially or at the same time, you should ideally use the same carrier screening panel. Um, what can happen when you use different panels is that couples may still be at risk of having affected children, even though the reports from each of those um, partners at first glance might suggest that the couple is not at risk. So, for example, um, the female partner in this um, case um, has had a test that tests for genes A, B and C, uh, but not D, and she's been found to be a carrier in genes A and C. Her male partner has had a test um, that tests genes B, C, and D, but not A, and he's been found to be a carrier in genes B and D. As a couple, they're at low risk for the conditions caused by genes B and C uh, because only one of them is a carrier um, in, in either gene. But because of the different panels that are used, their risk as a couple for conditions A caused by genes A and D remain unknown. Um, and unless you really examine the fine print of what exactly each panel tests and doesn't test, this sort of situation is quite easy to miss. Um, and so the best way to avoid this is to use the same panel so that the genes tested in both partners uh, completely overlap. Uh, so carrier screening is unusual in that risk is assessed on a couple's basis. And so one couple might be at low risk for the tested conditions, but as soon as you switch partners, it's a completely different uh, proposition. Um, so it's just good to be aware that unlike some genetic tests where it's a, you do a test once in a lifetime and that's your result, that's the end of it, um, carrier screening results do need to be reviewed um, over time, especially when patients change their reproductive partner. Evaluating family history, um, most couples who are found to be at risk of a recessive condition in a child are not going to have a family history, just because of how recessive inheritance works. And so family history isn't a reliable indicator of whether or not screening should be undertaken. Um, but uh, it's still important to establish whether um, there is any family history of genetic conditions um, because that information may influence um, test choice as well as whether patients are referred to um, professional pre-test genetic counselling, um, for example. Um, it would clearly not be useful um, to undertake a carrier screening test if a condition for which there's a known family history for um, isn't included in that, in that panel, or if it's some um, rare type of mutation in the family that's not going to be detected by that test. Um, so that, that information um, yeah, is still relevant. 
Um, so ultimately, um, I think the state of the art message when it comes to carrier screening is, is this, um, that, that if you combine the technological advances that now allow us to test uh, more genes at a lower cost with um, these principles of sound clinical practice, uh, discussion between the patient and the doctor about what to expect from the test um, and the limitations of the test, then uh, most patients are going to stand to significantly reduce their risk of having a child affected by a recessive condition. And that's regardless of which specific test is used. And that's really um, the, the key message here, that it's not the technology or the test that should be the foremost consideration, but, but really how that information from the test is used uh, to inform um, your clinical care that matters the most. Um, so that, that's the end of my talk. Thank you for, thank you for your time.